Good afternoon. Uh, today we are going to talk to Mr. Mkoziki Pile Mkize, a lecturer in the Department of Public Administration and Management. Welcome, sir. Uh, thanks, thanks for having me here. Thank you. Uh, can you share with us how did you become a researcher? Well, I must put it out there that that wasn't maybe something that I've always thought about, that I want to be interested in research. But uh, as much as uh, the scholars who actually argue that those who lead must read, I also subscribe to a saying that those who teach must research because in all honesty, what do you actually teach students or people out there or your audience, what are you actually teaching or presenting to if you're not actually a researcher? Um, initially, I wanted to be a teacher, a normal high school teacher interested in teaching maths and not in social sciences for that matter. So, <laughs> I then uh, realized that, oh, actually there's an opportunity not only to just get a degree in public administration, but to even go further and actually do teaching, which also then speaks to that notion on the right that I mentioned earlier that you need to be a researcher in order to teach. Uh, we cannot be using textbooks that were published in 2008 and 2023. That time, for instance, it used to say South African democracy was a miracle, something good. Something that was really nice for South Africans. But today, books are quite are moving uh, maybe down south from that whole narrative. So a teacher should be a constant researcher. So it actually speaks to that to say, I wanted to be a teacher. And as time went on, I believe that in order to teach, you should be a researcher. Thank you so much, sir. And then, what are you currently working on? Oh, uh, that's a tough one. Well, I'm working on a couple of things. Um, I can really put them. the first one would be uh, completing my PhD, which, which is actually due in the next three weeks. So uh, that's one priority that I'm quite working on at the moment. And I'm also preparing for a trip to the Philippines in Manila, where I'll be presenting a paper on public leadership and its effect uh, during uh, volatile and uncertain times, which COVID-19 was one of them with some complex issues we're actually facing the top. Um, as well as uh, preparing for a conference in Stellenbosch, Finland, to an international conference that public administration, scholars and researchers actually do go to annually. So, but that will be taking place in October. So that's some of the research that I work on and also as well as supervision of masters and honors uh, students. Thank you, sir. And then Coming back to your writings, is there any perspective or school of thought that influences your writing? Well, I wouldn't say per se, but maybe it's just the gaps that exist in it. And the whole notion of saying we might have not yet get gotten the right solution. Because I write a lot on corruption and it's corruption in the public sector. So I really believe that we still have a lot of work to do. We still have a way, a long way to go when it comes to what are the right remedies. So I'm getting it right in terms of the solution that we're putting out there and the policies that we have in these well, if I can call them imagined democracies, because they're not somehow like your USA and England, for instance. So I would say it's just the gaps that inspire me to say we don't have the right solutions as yet. Maybe there are level one right solutions. We still need more. Thank you, sir. And then when one talks about public administration, service delivery comes to mind. And then, are there any strategies that you think we can implement to advance our service delivery? Well, yes, uh, to be quite honest, you're quite right. And the real truth is that public administration is not only about service delivery. There's a whole lot that happens in between that part of service delivery. But that's one key element of priority that should be there for public administrators, which is to say they must make sure, public service rather, that they must make sure that there is service delivery. There are a couple of solutions. I mean, now we're talking about 
more of a paradigm shift or adding more solution when it comes to service delivery. Now there's a whole notion of sustainable service delivery to say how does sustainable development fit within the context of service delivery. So I can think of let's say fourth industrial revolution being in place because that's the buzzword now. That's something that's quite important to almost every scholar or even in academic institutions. I know a couple of universities that actually invest a lot of money when it comes to driving the whole notion of why are the fourth industrial revolution. So maybe um, adopting a couple of um, tools that for our promises to the world, like your artificial intelligence, spending less time when it comes to um, actually rendering certain services. I don't think we still need to have to be having queues in where we're just collecting IDs. So for instance, let's get an artificial intelligent machine um, and actually just gives out those particular passports or IDs because they're already available. So it's just picking it up. So why should you be in a queue? What you can get those nice robots, you can just move around and say, type in your ID number and it just prints out the actual, or just gives you the actual ID. So that's not only that, but also getting more of the community engaged in service delivery. Because I think the way it appears to community members or to the public in general, it's that service delivery is only held accountable, public servants are only held accountable when it comes to uh, making sure that you go on a protest or you strike. That's the only way that you participate in your democracy because service delivery is part of the bigger picture, which is democracy. So, and that's not the only way. They should be participating in a proactive manner. But we understand that even the promises that came before South Africa as a democratic country speak to how people behave today. So things are done in a reactive manner. So I believe that protests are a reactive manner. When something goes wrong, then you start to protest. So, and that's not what should be done. Citizens need to be actively, uh, um, um, need to be actively participant in everything that they do. They need to participate. They need to contribute to what's happening in the community before they even get to a point where a specific municipality cannot play their service, and then they uh, tend to protest. So, the, in, in a nutshell, I say, we need to make sure that our citizens are actually active for service delivery to take place, and let's get more ways of making them um, active. And, I mean, we're talking of fibers, areas having fiber, Wi-Fi, all of that. Um, let's have more people participating using any electronic means towards contributing to a much more sustainable um, public sector. Thank you so much, sir. And then looking at civilization, it mostly relies on public service. So why is public service so important? Um, well, because I mean, I'll say one thing that maybe a student wants answered me is that without public service, Government is has no purpose. Uh, in, in a colloquial word, it, it's useless. Mm -hmm. Government is only useful when it actually renders services. Because the difference between a, pub, a private, uh, in private sector, a private institution, and a public institution is that one renders services without actually expecting any, to make any profit out of that particular service. So it is one of the most important things because. You need to understand that the reasons that government is actually there is to actually to try and equalize that particular um, imbalance that is there. So it tries to balance the situations, your socioeconomic issues, and make sure that everybody has access to every service that is out there. Your basic services, you should be having it, uh, you should be getting it from your particular government. So every public service there. Uh, present in a particular country is very much important not only for uh, making sure that there's livelihood but even for growth uh, for any particular um, country or even area. Are there any exciting gaps within your field of study? Well, yeah, as mentioned earlier, yeah. there's quite a lot. There's quite a lot because for my PhD, I'm actually working on a conceptual model on to how to assess anti-corruption risk measures. 
So how do we tell that a law is working? Do we say because in 2021, uh, former President Jacob Zuma was taken to prison, then it's working? Do we say because 10 people were arrested on corruption, then therefore it's working? But uh, is it exactly what we're looking for from that particular law? So those are some of the gaps that exist. We have been giving solutions, but we're not really looking back. We're not stop taking on our solutions to say, is this really working? Because normally authors or scholars argue that South Africa has over 15 laws that speak to anti-corruption. But if you look at it quite closely, it's only two laws that actually speak to that. Because now people are starting to understand that, yes, you're right, PFMA, the Public Financial Management Act, speaks to saying that you shouldn't be uh, wasting the funds, there should be ways of combating corruption. But it doesn't necessarily speak to say, then what happens to the person who actually is found to be corrupt? Then that's where the Praka Act comes in, and that's what speaks to that. But now, the gap is much more uh, focused on, say, what is working, what is not working, what are the reason for it not to be working. Because if you know what's not working, and the reason for it not to work, you know exactly what to address. So I don't believe, as much as I said earlier on, we need more solutions, but I also think we need to consolidate some of these solutions. Not make them too many, but make them one, but address the pitfalls of each other. So those are some of the gaps and some that I can think of uh, if I were to pursue a postdoc. <laughs> Hopefully I've got my eyes in one of the best institutions on that one. Um, it will be something that has to do with the funding that comes through to your developing nations and uh, to fight certain issues that are out there. So not only food parcels, not only um, um, issues that the FDIs, the call them FDIs, not only FDIs, but uh, any type of funding that uh, is actually external to say what role does it play in a democracy. Um, and in actually making sure that you are more independent democracy, especially looking at where South Africa is at now, saying that they're neutral, they don't want to take any side between the West and the East when it comes to the Ukraine national war. Thank you so much. Thanks. And then coming back to your, your work, your writing, is there any perspective of school of thought that influenced your writing? Um, I wouldn't say per se, but I have had um, personal scholars who are actually those that when every time they write something that you want to read, because it's the I look at it in a way that it's it's the amount of depth that they actually contribute, and I was actually lucky to meet one of them, which is Professor Suzanne Rose who writes a lot on corruption, which is published over nine books on corruption for, for entire career. She's at uh, Yale University and I met, uh, I met her last year when I was in a Fulbright scholarship in the US. So and, uh, it was just understanding the part of how corruption actually contributes to the economy. And that's not the same as how people, society views corruption. It's just, it's more like you um, still of the Northern pillars. When you break them down, there's three of them. The economy and the social and the environmental elements of the opinions. So how economists view corruption is not necessarily the same as us. So, uh, um, social scientists view uh, corruption. So those are actually the things that interest me to say. Can there be more of a, a link between the two? Yes, possibly it has been there. But um, normally it's that question of saying, is unemployment a social or an economic problem? So, similarly with corruption, I'm still trying to keep the gap between the two. Who is more affected when it comes to corruption? Is it the social part or the economy part of it? Yes, you might argue that both of them are affected, but if we were to distinguish between the two, and say, let's choose between one and not be South Africa and be neutral, and then take one side, which one would you go for? So that's one of the things that I'm also um, uh, working on to understand and that influenced me. So she 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 really made me really interested to be to contribute more to this whole topic on corruption because she's 
She's from the economics, she's got a PhD in economics, but writes a lot on government corruption. So, yeah. I'm coming from the social side, going for the corruption role. <laughs> Thank you so much, Seth. And then, looking at your contribution uh, in your writing, is there any element of advancing the social development goal? Yes, certainly. Because, um, I mean, almost everything that I do or write about has, has that element of fitting in one of the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, funny enough, because I'm wearing the pin, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal, and I focus on Sustainable Development Goal 16, um, which focus on strong institutions in order to advance democracy, advance development. So that's one of the things that um, I focus on to say, can we have a strong NPA, National Prosecution Authority, in order to fight corruption? Can we have the hopes being more um, strong and more independent? I mean, actually, independence is one of my focus in that modern, that conceptual model, to say our, our anti-corruption institutions independent and if they're independent then they're likely to be strong so it's one of them uh, that i focus on which is sustainable development goal 16 i've worked on for my masters it was sustainable development goal 7 which is uh, access to energy okay thank you so much when you talk about uh, strong institutions what comes to mind is good governance yeah. Okay, thank you. And then, what message can you share with aspiring researchers? Well, I'll, I'll say um, they should keep on keeping on. They should keep going. Try some way. I know the world, the country, the institutions, academic institutions are moving more to say, focus on one topic, write on one topic, and make sure you're an expert on that topic. Sometimes it's just not possible when you're an aspiring um, scholar or aspiring researcher. Like myself, I believe I'm still an author, despite a couple of publications that I have, but I still believe that I'm still more of an emerging scholar, <coughs> and not scholar, but researcher. Um, so I would say they must start somewhere. Yes, you want to specialize, for instance, in, I don't know, uh, sustainable development uh, for education. Uh, but maybe for now, you just don't really have your mind around that, but you have interest on something else, which is not really what you want to keep for the rest of your career. It's fine to start somewhere, and as you grow, then you start to actually say, let me shape myself towards this particular topic. So you should start from one sentence, goes to a paragraph, from a paragraph to a full page. From a page, then you start developing your full um, article. It's only 15 pages sometimes, sometimes it's 13. So you should just get going, start somewhere, and after that, keep on keeping on. So, from your opinion, uh, talking about the uh, decolonization of the curriculum, mm -hmm. so what's your take on that? Well, Tough question, but interesting one, to be quite honest, because we've had serious investments on that by institutions, academic institutions, when trying to understand how can decolonization, or let's say, put it as decoloniality at some point, um, because, and uh, actually that's quite interesting, because we'll be hosting a seminar this year in October on this campus on decoloniality and sustainable development. From an African perspective, um, so, it's, it's, it's a very interesting topic, but here's what I would say, it's that it cannot be done overnight, and it seems like the people who are at the forefront of it just want it to happen today, just want it to happen next month, um, and I don't really think it can be done in a short run or short period of time, it needs to be done over time, because if you look at all the scholars, your, your hops, your Aristotle and all of these people, Machiavelli, these were people who actually took time and their theories and their knowledge was actually improved over time. 
Yes. In centuries, not even in decades, not even in decades, in centuries, where their work was improved. So if you were to decolonize and say, okay, let's look at Franz Fanon, for instance, and forget about what Machiavelli is saying, mm -hmm. then you need to also work towards developing that curriculum, starting to make sure that the curriculum speaks to the issues of whatever the change to address. And that's not only look inwardly, but let's make sure that you can also have a chance to be a global citizen. And as a global citizen, you should also be able to apply your theories, whether you learn them in a decolonized curriculum, but you should be able, if you were to be invited at Yale University, you should be able to also cope with your day. So we don't want to say, let's become countries that I cannot name, uh, and say, no, you need to learn only about South Africa, only about Africa, nothing else. Um, but I don't say, I'm not saying that that's what decolonization means, but um, let's not limit ourselves uh, and accept that it's going to take time. It's possible, but it's going to take time. So it's a good move, if you were to ask me that. It's an interesting one, though, uh, because uh, people are interested in different aspects of um, uh, philosophies that exist out there. And beliefs that uh, are actually that actually ground our curriculums. So um, yeah, let's 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 see. Thank you so much. And then apart from research, what are your other interests? Ah, I thought about this question so many times uh, during this weekend, and uh, can't get to answer. But I'll just tell you. Well, apart from research, uh, it maybe it speaks to the kind of person I am, personality. I just enjoy playing video games. I'm more of a video game person. So, but also when I'm playing video games, it's like I'm trying to be a little bit analytical about what's happening. So it's that curious mind of mine playing that game to say, are we going to get through this mission? Are we going to be successful? So it's that thing where it's like now everything I want to do, it's like I want to get past a particular level. So it's that personality that I've actually done. So I play a lot of PlayStation, FIFA, uh, watch a little bit of football, Man City play. So yeah, that, I guess this has been a good year for us. So yeah. I'm a cousin. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for your time, sir, and we really appreciate it. And we wish you all the best in your PhD. Yeah, thanks, thanks, thanks. Much needed. So, we're going to call the Yeah, well. <laughs>